All right, I think it's time to get started. Welcome, everybody. This is Theory of Computation. I'm glad to be here. My name is uh, Professor Stecker. That's how you say my last name. And um, Theory of Computation. Actually, I, um, this is a class that I really like. I don't know if your professors always claim to like all of their classes, but um, I do not really like all classes equally, but I really like this one, so I'm glad, uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm teaching Calc 1 right before this in this room. I'm teaching Calc 1 again right after this in this room, um, which is why you may see me eating my lunch. I hope you don't mind that. I feel like a high school teacher or something spending all day in the, in the same room. I should put some inspirational signs up on the walls or something. Um, theory of computation. Let's just look at the syllabus real quick, and then we'll get, get down to some, some business. Um, so you can see my email address there is the best way to get in touch with me. I will respond uh, quickly, hopefully. Um, my office is Bano 16 on the ground level. That's down where you know most of the math offices are down there. And my office hours are there Tuesday, Friday, 10 to 11, and Wednesday, 9 to 11. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any time in the middle of the day because I'm teaching these three classes back to back on Tuesdays and Fridays. But uh, if those times don't work for you, um, please let me know and we can you know, work something out uh, other than those. Um, and if you would prefer to meet by Zoom rather than coming to my office, that's fine with me. You know, During those times, I will have my Zoom turned on. And if not, um, I, have, I have like a notifications so that if you, if you come and I'm not there, it's probably because I just forgot to turn it on and I'll, I will arrive in a few seconds. All right, you can see the final exam. Date is there, Friday, May 3rd at 11.30. Be there. Um, if you look at this QR code, you will get to the class website which you will want to do because that's where I'm going to post the homework assignments from week to week. So you'll want to check that out every week at least. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to use Blackboard for this course. I hope you don't mind, but I, I'm, Blackboard is a little too fancy for my tastes. So um, I just am going to use my own DOM website. All right. Uh, the textbook is there, Formal Language, A Practical Introduction. This doesn't sound like a math or computer science book, but it is. Um, it is uh, not too expensive, I hope. And you didn't hear it from me, but it's actually fairly easy to find a bootleg uh, PDF of it online. So uh, if you don't want to buy it or if you're unable to buy it for whatever reason, that's something to consider. Um, all right, the course description. Let's just look at the course description there. It says, this course explores what computers can and can't do by examining simple mathematical models of computation. Topics include finite state machines, regular expressions, non-determinism, push-down automata, context-free grammars, and Turing machines. This comes from the official course description, by the way. I didn't write these words. We will see that there are limits to what computers can do. And in doing so, we will learn about what a computer really is. You may be surprised. Huh? We'll see. Uh, actually, I think that the topic in my, one, one reason that I like this course so much is that, you know, it is interesting like mathematics in, in my opinion, but it also, um, the mathematics really does have something interesting to say like about the world and humanity and like my, my place in the universe, I feel. Um, so I hope that you will feel uh, a similar way, although you don't have to feel the way that I feel about it. Um, but uh, I think actually this sort of, you may be surprised, that there is some like genuinely sort of philosophically interesting and somewhat surprising things that we're gonna talk about, in my opinion. So that's a little something to look forward to. I'm gonna try and give you a flavor for that today, but we'll, um, we'll get into the details of it as we go through the semester. All right, just some, uh, some details here. Uh, we're gonna have homework due each week, and the homework will be due on Tuesdays, not today, but um, I think we'll probably have enough to have a, a short homework assignment due next Tuesday. The idea is we do you know, a certain amount of stuff uh, throughout the week, and then whatever we did that week, it will be on the homework assignment for the following Tuesday. So you have the weekend to do it, plus a couple extra days. Um, all of the homework is going to be submitted on Gradescope. I hope that you're familiar with Gradescope. Um, 
If not, it's a, it's a simple way to send in your homeworks. You write them out um, typically on paper, although you could type it if you want, if you want to, uh, and then take, take uh, phone pictures of your pages and send them in that way. It's easy and it works well. Uh, so the homeworks are going to be due, you know, that, uh, you're not going to actually give me your homework on paper during class, so the homeworks will be due on Tuesday at midnight, like Tuesday night. Um, so uh, hopefully you can do the homework over the weekend, but if, uh, if it's Tuesday and you still have questions, something you can't figure out, I would be happy to chat about it on Tuesday, uh, and then it's due Tuesday night. All right, any questions about that? Great. We are also going to have a quiz every week on Friday. So this, the idea is Tuesday, the homework is due on Tuesday, and then we'll have a quiz on that same material on the Friday after the homework is due. This probably means, well, you, you, you will have seen your homework grade by then, but not very, not very many days before then. So, um, uh, but the quiz is, it says here, um, Quiz questions are meant to be similar to the easier textbook questions. So the idea is, um, on the homework, I would expect and hope that you uh, work together on it. It's totally fine with me if you want to work with your friends and if you, you know, when you write up your homework answers, if your answer looks exactly the same as your roommate's answer, that's okay with me. I'm not going to try to uh, be a detective about who really came up with these answers. Um, the quiz is just meant to make sure that you actually understand what you were doing on the homework. And the idea is the quiz is supposed to be fairly routine. The questions will be very similar to, like I said, similar to the easier homework questions. And um, the idea is if you did the homework and everything more or less made sense to you, then you should be able to do the quiz no problem. It's not meant to be a big sort of stressful thing. We will do the quiz at the beginning of class every Friday. It'll take 10 minutes or so. You hand it in, and then we'll just go on with the with the rest of class. So that's this is my vision for the quiz. All right. I hope that doesn't seem too uh, stressful. Uh, it says no calculators on the quizzes. I mean, this isn't really that kind of class, but uh, just in case you're wondering, no calculators. Any questions about the homeworks and the quizzes? All right. And then on the back, you will see we're also going to have tests. Two tests during the semester plus the final exam at the end. Again, no calculators on the tests. And the tests will take up the whole class period on those, on those days. All right? Not too complicated, I don't think. That's going to be your whole grade, the homeworks, the quizzes, and the tests. And I thought this might be fun. Um, I would like for each of you to think about what uh, percentages uh, you want those three topics to count in your grade. So the homework, the quizzes, and the tests. And your grade will be some kind of average of those. Uh, it will be up to you to choose the percentages in each of those three categories. And it says the rules are your percentages should add up to 100. Um, each of the three categories has to be 30 or more, so you can't go like 0% on the exams. But um, so 30 or more. And then uh, I would like you to tell me on or before February 6th. So this will be uh, in a couple weeks. It will be after you've seen a, a quiz or two. So you'll have some idea of how, how those go. But um, you know, think about how you like to be evaluated. I know some people say like I'm really bad at tests or some people are really good at tests. If you want the test to be worth more. The homework kind of, you sort of have like unlimited amount of time to do the homework. The quizzes and the exams are both uh, you know, timed. So those are things to consider. But think about it. Wait till we see the, the quizzes to see you know, how you feel about the quizzes. But uh, tell me sometime on or before February 6th. And it says at the end there, if you never tell me, you will default to exactly 33% for each category. Sometimes I have people who just never want to tell me. And I'm not trying to screw you with this. I will, I will send emails to remind you. But sometimes people just don't tell me. If you don't tell me, I will screw you by one point. You're going to get 33% in each category, not 33 and a third, exactly 33. All right. Um, everything's going to be on Gradescope. And I think that's all the details that I wanted to share. Anybody have any questions about any of that? It's pretty, uh, pretty no nonsense, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, have them email you login information. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, thanks. 
All right. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm going to try and do everything on the screens here. I like to, um, one reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to be recording class every day and I'm going to post it after the fact in case you miss class or something like that. You can go check it out if you want to. If you didn't get something, you want to go watch it again. Be sure to like and subscribe. Um, that's why I'm going to record this. And hopefully, I'm actually not sure about today. I don't know if my laptop, my laptop can survive all day long without being plugged in, so we're going to find out. It's not going to die during this class, but uh, we'll see how it goes afterwards. All right. Um, this class, uh, I see some people with their, with their uh, laptops, which is fine. I think you will find when you're taking notes for this class, you're going to want to be able to draw. Uh, there's going to be a lot of diagram type stuff, which, which is, in my in my experience, a real pain to do if you're trying to type everything. So that's just my own advice, although, of course, you can do whatever you want. All right, any questions about anything before we get going? I thought maybe we'd do a little sort of introduction to what the idea of the class is all about, and then maybe get down to some, some details. All right, great. Um, I think, I, I don't like how this door overlaps the screen, so I'm gonna Keeping the door open, but you can't see that corner there. Um, feel free to come and go as you please if you need to step out. Okay, great. So this course, here's my little introduction to the theory of computation. This is a course about the idea of a computer. That's how I would describe it. Um, the idea of a computer and kind of the theoretical capabilities and limitations of computers. That's what the description said. Something about um, this course explores what computers can and can't do. So this is about the idea of a computer and its capabilities and limitations. And I think the most, um, the most important, or like for, I can remember actually, I took a course like this when I was in college. And the most surprising thing to me from that course was just that there are limitations at all. Um, there are things that a computer cannot do. And I mean, I don't mean like a computer can never truly love or something like that. I mean like real things, and I also don't mean like, you know, my Bluetooth never seems to work right. I mean real, like, mathematical things, theoretical things that a computer cannot do and can never do. Things that, like, you know, ChatGPT is not terribly good at. There are actually things that ChatGPT cannot do ever, um, no matter how good it, it becomes, all right? There are actual limitations, like logical, mathematical limitations to what computers can do. I don't know if this is surprising to me or if you even believe me, but it, it's, uh, it's actually true. Um, I will say most of the ideas in this class, and I'm actually gonna give you an example before we're done today of a thing that no computer can, can do. Um, uh, most of the ideas for this class actually were created or existed before real life computers were, were constructed. So most of the, um, the things that we are going to talk about come from around the uh, start of the 20th century. 19, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s is when this, this discipline really began. Um, in the, uh, in the scale of like mathematics that you have learned in your life, probably this is some of the newest mathematics that you've ever learned because things that you learn in math are, are typically older than that. But um, this uh, began around the start of the 20th century before there were anything like what we now know as real life computers um, that were actually constructed. But uh, around this time, what really I would say got this going is people were talking about, people I will say wondered about algorithms. 
Now, today when somebody says the word algorithm to me, I think of a computer program that does something. That's, to me, that's what the word algorithm means. Uh, but this is meant in a slightly more general mathematical sense as just kind of any specific procedure which you can, like a sequence of steps or something like that where you can follow the steps and actually solve some kind of problem or get some kind of answer after a finite number of steps, all right? But people were wondering about algorithms that would, uh, you know, the, what, if you had asked someone back then what is an algorithm, they would have said something like um, a finite specific procedure for solving a problem. All right. And it was a question that a lot of people were asking at this time in the history of mathematics. This is when sort of like modern philosophy of mathematics started becoming um, a thing that people really talked about. Um, and a major question that people had at that time was this question. Is it possible um, to answer any mathematical question algorithmically? Like, is it actually true that any math problem can, in theory, be solved by some kind of procedure? Or are there some math problems for which there can be no procedure to solve them? Not just we don't know how to do it, but actually, like, there is no procedure to solve these problems. So uh, the big question that mathematic mathematicians had in mind was, like, are all problems actually solvable by algorithms? This was a major sort of mathematical philosophy kind of question at the time. But it, it's not just a philosophy question. It's a real mathematical question. Because like, if your answer is no, that means there is some specific problem which cannot be solved by any algorithm. And that's a mathematical statement, right? Um, this was actually in, at the beginning of the 20th century. There was a big uh, conference, international conference of mathematicians. And um, there was this guy, David Hilbert, who was regarded as one of the kind of top dogs in mathematics globally at the time. And he, um, he published a list of the new problems for the 20th century. This was in like the year 1901 or something. It was something like around 25 math problems, unsolved math problems at the time. And he said, these are the problems that are going to define the work of the 20th century of mathematics. And um, most of them have been solved by now. Uh, but one of them was this question. Is there any problem which has no algorithmic solution? Or is it the case that any problem in mathematics can, in theory, be solved by some kind of specific algorithm procedure? All right? This was a big deal. Um, actually, that, his list of problems was so famous that in the year 2000, somebody created a new list of the new problems for the new millennium uh, that had, I think, uh, eight problems. And they, uh, I don't know if you've heard, they're called the Millennium Problems now. And they, uh, there's a million dollar prize attached to each one of them if you can solve them. And uh, one of them has been solved so far, so get, get to work on the other ones. There's money to be made. Um, anyway, this was, um, so back in, like in the 20th century, and even now, today, people still talk about the Hilbert problems. This was this famous list of problems. One of them was the Riemann hypothesis, which you might have heard of, which is one of the millennium problems. That's the, that's the only one that Hilbert identified, which is still unsolved and still considered to be super important. But there, some of the other ones were unsolved. Anyway, this, um, this is the basic question that got into the mind of someone you've probably heard of. That is uh, Alan Turing. And it's really his work that more or less everything in this course is based on Turing's basic idea. But you could also say more or less all of computer science ever is based on Turing's basic ideas. He's regarded as the originator, one of the uh, OGs of computer science. Um, the big question here from a mathematical point of view, or the big issue in trying to answer this question is just this, this thing, right? Nobody at the time really knew 
what exactly is meant by an algorithm? If you want to ask yourself specifically what kinds of mathematics is accessible to being solved by algorithms, you have to be very specific about what exactly does an algorithm mean. And it means this, but this is not a, um, this is not a mathematically specific sentence here, right? Like, uh, I, I guess finite, everybody knows what finite means, but a specific procedure for solving a problem, this when you think specifically about it, I mean, what exactly counts as a procedure or what makes something a procedure versus not a procedure and what counts as, what even counts as a problem? Like these are things that you have to be very particular about and there are no easy ways to say specifically what counts as a procedure. Like I shoveled my driveway this morning because it snowed. Um, I mean, I could, my back still hurts from doing that. That feels like a procedure to me, but actually that doesn't count. As, that's not what I mean when I say a mathematical algorithm, right? What, do, what exactly do you mean? Well, it's not, it's not clear, right? So Alan Turing, his big contribution, which sort of accidentally ended up creating computer science is Alan Turing had this idea of what exactly an algorithm is. So Turing, I have the date since I'm talking about history, I might as well tell you. Turing lived 1912 to 1954. Somewhat of a tragic life in my opinion. If you know anything about Turing, you may agree. Um, so Turing, his big idea was he decided that an algorithm, Turing's big um, sort of contribution was to give a definition for what constitutes an algorithm. He didn't describe it in terms of a procedure for solving a problem because that's too vague. Turing decided that an algorithm is, this was his big idea, any procedure that can be mechanized, that is, Anything which can be done by sort of a mindless machine, that's what an algorithm is. Um, now, on the surface, this is no more specific than this business up here. This is kind of vague. What exactly is meant by a machine? What counts as a machine? Is a human being a machine? Turing actually didn't really want to get into that, but he said any procedure that can be mechanized using a specific, I would say, theoretical machine defined by set theory. So Turing actually gave the details of a specific machine, not, he didn't create it in his basement, but he described exactly what its capabilities were, and all of this described in the mathematical language of set theory, all right? This was his big idea. Um, and he referred to his machine, his theoretical machine, he referred to as the universal machine. And this is actually an extremely modern idea, and this is what makes Turing's idea of computation different from before, you know, even before the 1920s, there was such a thing as computing machines. You know, there were actually fairly sophisticated calculating machines that were built in the late 1800s that can add and multiply numbers and such with gears and, and things like that. Um, so there did exist computing machines before this time, but Turing's big idea was that there could, in theory, be a single machine which didn't have a particular purpose. It was not a machine for adding or multiplying or something specific like that. But there could be a machine which in theory could do anything. It didn't have a specific purpose, but it could be reconfigured to do whatever you tell it to do. It could to do anything. And this is, you know, he called this a universal machine. This is what we would nowadays call a computer. And that's actually what, that's what's good about a computer is that it doesn't have a specific task or it doesn't have a specific use that it does. It's not like a coffee maker which makes coffee. A computer is a thing. The whole point of it is that it can do whatever you want. It doesn't do any specific thing. Um, and that's what's so great about it. I, I imagine, you know, if I met somebody from, from a thousand years ago and they asked me like what 
what kind of technology do you have? I would say maybe, you know, one of the most important technology we have is a, is a computer. And they would say, oh, what does it do? And the answer is kind of like, well, it doesn't really do anything. It does everything. It, it doesn't, it's not meant to do a specific thing. It can do whatever you want. That, anyway, this, is, this was Turing's idea long before any machine like that actually existed. But he had this idea that you could build a machine which was sort of reprogrammable and you could make it do whatever you want. Um, this is how Turing defined algorithms. And he said an algorithm is any procedure that you can do using this machine, this universal machine. Um, nowadays, we say an algorithm is just any computer program, which is basically what Turing meant when he said that. All right. Um, Turing never built one of these universal machines. He built some sp uh, special purpose machines for, for calculating things. Um, Turing is uh, also very well known, like outside of math and computer science. Um, he was he worked during World War II as a code breaker, and Turing was in charge of the team which um, which decoded the Nazi Enigma machine, which was the the code that they used in their submarines to communicate with each other. Um, and Turing actually built some big gear-driven computing machines to help with this task, but he never made a, um, he never tried to make one of these universal machines. But shortly after Turing uh, published his work, basically everybody realized that we wanted to create one of these universal machines, and that was later done by other people. Turing died kind of young, younger than me, I guess. Um, he was uh, sort of tragically at the end of his life um, he was, by any measure, like one of the great uh, heroes of World War II. Um, cracking the Enigma Code, you know, was was very important in in defeating the Nazis. Um, but after uh, that whole deal was classified for many decades, and during Turing's life, it was never known to the public that he had anything to do with that. And so he kind of was living in obscurity as a he was like famous among mathematicians, but ordinary people didn't, didn't really care about him. And, um, and he was also gay, which was really uh, became a problem for him. He, um, uh, being gay was illegal at the time. It, he was in, in England. And um, he, so this is the story, uh, the tragic story of, of the end of Turing's life is he, um, I think he was in a relationship with a, with a man who was, was either abusing him or somehow like trying to rob him or something. And he got fed up with this guy and he called the police. Um, they came to, the, to his apartment and he's like, you know, this guy is trying to rob me or something, get, get, get him out of here. And the police were like, okay. Um, but then they were like, hey, are, are, you guys like, are you guys like a thing? And Turing, um, I, I imagine him as being sort of a typical sort of socially oblivious mathematician type Turing was like, yeah, yeah, we're a thing, but I, you know, I don't want anything, I don't want anything to do with him. Uh, but they, um, anyway, they, they were not cool with that, and they arrested him. And his uh, his punishment for being gay was that they put him on some kind of, uh, some kind of, um, bogus hormone therapy to like turn him straight or something, and it ended up totally messing with his health, and he ended up dying probably by suicide. Uh, it's not exactly clear shortly after that. Um, so a tragic tale. Um, and it, uh, I, was, I was encouraged to learn that the, the government of the United Kim Kingdom officially apologized to Alan Turing, something like in 2017 or something like that. Like they officially said, you know, we, sh we shouldn't have done that. And it's, this is, a, he was a great, uh, Great mathematician and great uh, hero of the war, and so on. Anyway, this is the tragic story of, of uh, Alan Turing. Um, I also learned, I, I saw, like less than a year ago, something came up in my Google News thing, because they know that I'm into Alan Turing, I guess. Um, somebody, um, somebody like in Wisconsin had a bunch of original documents from Turing's um, research that they had stolen from a library in, in England, and um, they uh, decided to give them back. So good for them, I guess. Um, anyway, 
This is the story of Alan Turing. So anyway, what, what we're going to be talking about in this class is specifically about like Turing's um, abstract model of the universal machine. And um, this course, you will, you'll, you'll gather fairly quickly, this course we are not going to do a lot or perhaps any actual pro programming with actual computers because that's, you know, this class is not about um, my computer, like a Mac laptop versus your computer, a, a Samsung phone. It's about the idea of any kind of computing machine. So we're gonna talk about uh, the capabilities of Turing's abstract universal machine, which are automatically the same capabilities exist for real life uh, computers, any, any real life computer. All right. Um, what is philosophically interesting that I will occasionally mention, but I'll, I'll uh, mention it now just so that you can think about it a little bit, is that um, Turing's idea of universal uh, machines for computation, and like I said, there are limitations, fundamental mathematical limitations to any kind of computing machine. Um, this means something, in my opinion, about the human brain, just because the human brain is some kind of computing machine, it, it exists like as a physical object in the real world and it, it behaves according to the laws of physics. Um, and so in that sense, at least it seems that the human brain also fits into Turing's abstract model of uh, a computing machine, all right? Um, what this means is that uh, limitations of the universal, the abstract universal machine, are also necessarily limitations of human beings. And and you know we, we tend to think of like computers can do certain things, but people, we're like really different. Um, and I would say yes, people are different from computers at least today at this point in history. But um, who knows about the future? And any kind of abstract mathematical limitations that exist for universal. Uh, computing machines, they must necessarily also exist for human beings, unless you believe that somehow the brain is a, is a magical thing, it, it's not a real machine at all. Um, uh, this is something to think about though, in my opinion. I'm not going to try and tell you how to think about things. Um, I, um, I had a hard time with this actually when I was in college because I am, uh, I'm, you, know, you don't have to care about this, but I'm a person of faith. And I, I actually don't really like thinking of myself as a machine. Um, I don't like thinking of my brain as a, as a thing which is simply obeying physical laws. I like to think that I have some kind of a, an eternal soul and that, um, you know, uh, that there's real value in something other than my physical body. Um, so this was a hard thing for me to accept as a, uh, as a youth when I first learned about this. But I will tell you, um, I still believe that I have a beautiful soul, and I still believe that my brain is a universal Turing machine with limitations for mathematical reasons. Uh, it's not, um, it feels a little weird, but uh, I don't think actually there's a, there's a conflict there. You know, it's a, most people of faith also accept as a basic fact in faith, this is certainly true if you're a Christian or a Catholic, that the human body is an imperfect vessel it is the, the home of our soul, but it's not uh, perfect, and it doesn't do everything that we want it to do. I think this is very much consistent with uh, an immortal soul that lives inside of a, of a machine that has to obey certain rules. But anyway, these are all things that I think about sometimes. I don't care if you want to think about them too, but it's interesting to me. All right, let's get to, I said I would tell you about one real example of a thing that a computer cannot do by the end of today. Uh, this is still sort of by way of introduction, but um, I would like to talk to you about um, oops, an uncomputable problem. We now know that there are actually mathematically uncomputable things. There are things which cannot be solved by any algorithm, and these are called uncomputable sometimes they are called undecidable problems. And the most famous of these you may have heard of, this is called the halting problem. 
So I would like to, let's just talk a little bit about the halting problem. Um, and actually today, and this may be uh, probably not the only time all semester, but I actually have some real code that I wanna show you on my, uh, on my computer here related to the halting problem. Um, Everybody knows, so I, I know many of you are computer science majors, I think. Even if you're not, uh, you should have taken our course in Python already. I'm not really gonna use any heavy duty Python, but I hope you remember at least the basics of that. Um, and I'm sure you remember, when you write code, you often get error messages when you try to run your code. Like most of the time, you get error messages. When you don't get an error, then you're done with your homework and you move on to something else. But that. Most, uh, you get error messages all the time. Um, that is the um, compiler or the interpreter, depending on what you're using. The interpreter, I'll just say interpreters. Interpreters tell us when we have errors in the code. If you like spell something wrong or do something that is, that's not allowed in the language that you're using, you get an error. You, it won't even try to run the code. It gives you an error. But there are, it doesn't tell you about every error, right? There are some errors that, that the, the compiler doesn't tell you about, and you, you wouldn't know that they exist in your code um, unless it's you know, for other reasons. They tell us when we have an error, but interpreters actually, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but interpreters uh, typically, won't um, warn us about infinite loops. This is another thing that exists in computer programs. Uh, generally speaking, when you're writing code, you never want it to have an infinite loop because that, like, that's usually the cause of when your computer freezes up. It's because it's trying to do something over and over again forever and not getting anywhere with it. Um, I don't know if anyone ever wondered, why doesn't, the, say, the Python interpreter, I mean, it can tell when I have a typo in my code, why doesn't it tell me if my code is going to have an infinite loop in it? And I suppose the answer is, well, that's a lot harder to tell if your code is gonna have an infinite loop or not, versus a typo is fairly easy to spot. Um, but, uh, of course, people who make these interpreters are pretty smart people, and they've been doing it for a long time. How, why? Why haven't they come up with some kind of like infinite loop detector for the compiler, for the, inter the interpreter, so that it will check before trying to run my code if there's gonna be an infinite loop? So my question is, can there be an infinite loop detector The answer is no, but I mean, if there was, then that would be something you should just like build that into the compiler or the interpreter, because then it would it would be very helpful, right, to the programmer if the interpreter could flag ahead of time and say, hey, this there's going to be an infinite loop. And actually, there's nothing even close to that. Like you can write a, an entire Python program that just says this. Anyone know what pass does in Python? I, I have to look this up every so often. Pass does nothing. This is, in, in Python, if you write this, the next line has to be indented. But if you want it to do nothing, you can't just like indent and leave nothing there. It do doesn't like that. That's the purpose of pass. You will almost never use this in your real life. But um, anyway, this is a legal Python program. You can type that in and hit it, and it's gonna go for it. It, it doesn't, even any idiot can tell that this is going to make an infinite loop. This while true will just repeat this over and over again forever. Um, surely there could be something which can detect if there are infinite loops like this. Uh, well, I would like to give you, so it turns out, can there be an infinite loop detector? This question here, it turns out, this is mathematically impossible. And I'm going to try to show you why before we leave today. We got time, right? When we finish at oh, 1.45? Yeah, all right. We'll see. Uh, it's not possible, actually, to make an infinite loop detector. Um, I would like to, I hope you don't mind these little uh, historical stories. One more little historical tidbit. Um, 
just a little, a little uh, diversion a little bit. I would like you to consider a famous unsolved problem in mathematics called the perfect box problem. This is actually a, an unsolved problem today. Uh, nobody knows the answer to what I'm about to describe to you. Uh, the question is, can you make a rectangle? This is an easy version of the question. Um, is there a rectangle? Can we make both sides and the diagonal all integers? Anybody know the answer? This is not the unsolved problem. This is actually, once you see the answer, everybody will, will agree. Oh, yeah, that's how you. Anybody say, how, how would you make, choose the side, this is a you know right angled rectangle, both sides and the diagonal all integers, that is whole numbers, no decimals or anything. Yeah? No. The answer is yes, you can. It is possible. It's like the same as two right triangles. There are like uh, special right triangles. Yeah, special right triangles. You y'all remember the uh, the old three four five triangle? This is not something you need to know for this course. But uh, if I make this a three and this a four, then the diagonal will be a five, right? So it is possible. Is that the only way to do it? No, there are other. There are other, these are called the Pythagorean triples, all right? So this is well understood that you can make both sides and the diagonal all integers. The more interesting problem is this. Can we do it with a three-dimensional box where all the sides and all the side diagonals all integers? Can we do that? So that means the sides and also that diagonal and also that diagonal and also that diagonal, right? And the ones on the back, but they're the same as the ones on the front. So this is really all we need, those six diagonals. Can you make all of those diagonals all integers, all right? Is that possible? Well, this is more complicated. You could make one of them a three, four, five, uh, but then you'd have to figure out, like I could put those ones here, three, four, five, right? But then I would have to figure out, okay, that means this is a three. Uh, then I'd have to figure out how to, how to choose these. I guess I could do the three, four, five again, but then the diagonal, um, then the top is gonna be messed up because the top would be four by four and the diagonal would be the square root of 32, which is not an integer, right? It's, it's, it's more complicated here, all right? But actually, I would like to uh, share with you, I wrote a little, Python code that can try to figure this out. This is what they call in the business trying to solve this by brute force. Now, I don't, I don't care if you want to read through this in detail. I'm going to post this on the, on the class website later. You can check it out. But basically what it's going to do is, here it says triples. The first thing, it's going to generate all possible three, uh, three coordinate triples. It's basically going to try to just guess three different sides for the, the length, width, and height here. It's just going to guess three different sides and then figure out what the diagonals are and see if they're all integers or not. Um, and it, it just, by brute force, it's going to create all possible uh, three-dimensional boxes and check for if it's a perfect box or not. So in my, I'm gonna run this, I'm old school, so I run my Python into terminal. Uh, I call this perfect box. What? Oh, sorry. I'm old school and not very good at this. So I'm going to run this function called perfect box. And what it says here, sorry, it's off the side. It is now trying to construct boxes. It's constructing all possible boxes and then just checking to see if the diagonals are all integers, which they're usually not. You can see it, it's kind of slowing down now because uh, this, it says m equals whatever. Those values of m are the sum of the three dimensions. So it says m equals 400. That means it's going to try all possible boxes where the three dimensions add up to 400. Um, hey, look at that. We found one, right? 
So actually, there is a perfect box. It has those dimensions, and that's actually the smallest one. And for a long time, people didn't know this just because it's such a, such a weird, big, uh, seemingly random thing that, to check, all right? But anyway, that's, that's uh, my question here. All sides and all side diagonals, all integers. The answer is yes, this is possible. So can we do this? Yes, I forgot the numbers already, but that's what it was, all right? Now I said this was gonna be about an unsolved problem. The unsolved problem is this. What if I want all of that and also, what about, so a perfect box, This is also sometimes called an Euler box or an Euler brick or an Euler cuboid. It has other names. But anyway, a perfect box also has the solid diagonal an integer. That is the diagonal that goes straight through the box from one corner to its opposite in three dimensions. All right? And that I did not check for in this code. I only checked the, the diagonals on the sides, but not the one straight through the middle. All right? So a perfect box also has the solid diagonal as an integer. And this is unknown whether this exists or not. People have been working on this problem for I would say at least 100 years people realized that this was an interesting question to ask, and it's still it's not known if this is possible. This would be in the, uh, in the mathematical area called number theory, which is about numbers, usually whole numbers, which I actually personally don't know a lot about number theory, but so I, I am not personally working on this problem. But I would like to suggest that uh, couldn't you do the same thing with the code that I just did, I mean the code that I just did did not check the solid diagonal, but you could also check the solid diagonal and do the same thing, right? And actually I did that. So if you look in my, in my code here, you will see, I don't know if you can see this and it's not, it's not so important, but this, this line right here, it says if almost perfect box, then return that and that's when it stops. But this is what I called an almost perfect. It didn't have the solid one. What if I switch it with this one, which was commented? Now it's going to only stop when it finds the perfect, perfect box with the solid diagonal also an integer. So I'm going to get out of here, reload it, run it again. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. So now it's running again. Now it's searching for the true perfect box, the perfect, perfect box. All right. Anybody want to predict what's going to happen here? Yeah? It's going to run forever. I mean, well, is it going to run forever? Uh, when, when this code finds the perfect, perfect box, it's going to stop, right? Because that, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, now, it is today a mathematically unsolved problem whether such a perfect box exists or not, all right? That means. I think we can all agree it's not going to stop anytime during this class, right? Because nobody knows actually if it's even possible to do this. And people have, people have tried this before. I'm not the first person to ever write this program, right? So um, people have tried to compute in the same way whether the perfect box exists. No one has ever found it, but there's never been a proof that it's impossible, all right? So I would say what's going to happen is at least if we leave this running for the rest of the class, it's not going to stop just because no. Um, People have already tried that. But um, I don't know for sure if this is going to run forever, like really forever, because I don't know if a perfect box exists or not. All right? Um, I'm going to stop it for now, though, just to save my, save my battery life. Right? There. Um, so anyway, what that means is, so it's mathematically not known if it's possible to find a perfect box. What that means is it's mathematically unknown if my code, like that specific code that I just wrote, 
is an infinite loop or not. Right? And now, if you're thinking in terms of like having an infinite loop detector built into your compiler, I hope that your opinion at this point is that's, that can't be possible, right? Because if it was possible, then your compiler could somehow determine by some magic if this code is going to stop or not, which means somehow the, its capabilities, not only is it, is it capable of detecting loops in a Python code, but it is somehow capable of proving the perfect box conjecture, right? Which the greatest minds of the century have not been able to do. Um, if there was a computer capable of detecting infinite loops, it would also be capable of solving all kinds of unsolvable mathematical problems, which probably that's not possible, at least in, in my opinion, all right? It's mathematically unknown if my code is an infinite loop or not. In fact, in our remaining, oh, we still got 20 minutes? No problem. It would be actually paradoxical if some infinite loop detector actually existed. All right. I'm trying to tell you about some limitation that no computer can have an infinite loop detector. Actually, and I'm gonna to try to explain why. If, if such a thing did exist, this would cause some kind of logical incons inconsistency. So this, you could say, is like a proof by contradiction that no infinite loop detector could possibly exist. So I'm going to say, so here's a little proof, right? We're gonna assume, in order to get a contradiction, that we have, let's just say this like in very specific terms in a, in a Python code or something, that we have a function that's called, I'll call it, does it halt of f? And the idea is you plug some other Python function into it and it just gives you a true or false based on does that other function have an infinite loop or does it stop, all right? This gives true or false based on if f halts. By the way, this is a little weird, but this is allowed in Python. You can plug a function as a, uh, as a variable into another function that, that is allowed because Python allows functional programming. Um, all right, so this is gonna be a proof by contradiction. So I'm gonna explain why. If you allow that this exists, then you can do something else with that, which is somehow nonsensical. That's the idea behind a proof by contradiction, right? So we're gonna assume we have a function called does it halt like this, and it just tells you true or false whether the function halts or not. Now, I'm going to use that to define another function. I'll just call this one, I'm gonna write this in real Python, g is another function with no, no variables, no parameters. And this is what it says. If does it halt of g, and then inside while true pass. All right, this is the definition of another function, all right? This is very weird if you try to think about what this says because it, it's immediately like recursive or self-referential. The function I'm defining is called g and the definition says if g itself halts, then you do this, which is an infinite loop. And if not, I didn't put the else, but if not, there's nothing else. So if not, then it just won't do anything, all right? Uh, this is very strange because I'm, I'm putting g on the inside here when g is the thing that I'm defining. Uh, and you might wonder if that's actually allowed in Python, but the answer is yes, it is allowed. You've probably used uh, recursive functions from time to time. Um, that is allowed. So this actually is totally legit. Um, the only thing that's not legit is this does it halt is actually, this cannot exist, but that's, I'm assuming that it does exist to get a contradiction. So anyway, if you look at this, you know, this part right here, this makes an infinite loop, right? That's what the pass means. 
while true pass. Sorry, I need a colon there. That's what the compiler would say. Um, while true pass will just loop forever doing nothing. All right. So if I were to analyze the behavior of sort of in words, what does G do? Well, it starts by checking if G halts. And if G does halt, it does an infinite loop. So what G does is if G halts, then what does G does? Then G does an infinite loop. Because this is the definition of G that I'm talking about, right? So if G does halt, then it goes in here and does an infinite loop. Uh, and, and the other way, if G does not halt, then it skips this part and does nothing. So if G doesn't halt, then G uh, stops and does nothing. Right? This is just in words explaining what the what the code means. Anybody see any problems with this? I'm doing a proof by contradiction. You're, you're supposed to get to some kind of problem eventually. It says if G halts, then G does an infinite loop. And if G does not halt, then G stops and does nothing. Maybe I'll, re I'll rewrite this in a more uh, more scandalous way. This this right here, rephrase a little bit. It says, if G halts, then it says here, G does an infinite loop, right? That means it runs forever. That means it doesn't halt, right? And the second part says, if G doesn't halt, then it stops and does nothing. That means it halts. The second part says, if G doesn't halt, then G halts. Does that sound like nonsense to anybody else? I hope you agree, this is impossible. This is like a, this is like, you know, saying I always lie or something like that. This is like a immediately self-contradictory uh, situation, all right? So this is impossible. This is a paradoxical, like logically paradoxical situation. So this cannot actually exist in the real world. This is impossible. So the conclusion, since that whole thing is impossible, it means that G must not exist, right? That's what I conclude from this, from this statement. It's not possible for any G to obey these two statements, which means G, as I've defined it, must not exist. But like I said before, Everything about the definition of G is totally legitimate Python. The only thing that's, that's questionable is just the fact that I used this thing here. So my only conclusion, if G cannot exist logically, the only conclusion is that this function right here cannot exist logically, all right? So G must not exist, which means, so does it halt, cannot exist. All right, end of the proof. This, is, this has demonstrated that there can be no, I mean, specifically I'm talking about Python here, but there can be no Python program that will tell you if another Python function halts or not, all right? And this is, uh, this is not specific to Python, although I'm just talking about it in the context of Python. It's not specific to Python. We're gonna talk about it in more generality later on in the course, like much later, but um, this is the halting problem, and it is the fundamental um, limitation of uh, any computer, uh, anything operating in terms of algorithms, cannot solve the halting problem. What that means is it's not possible to, in all cases, detect whether a program has an infinite loop or not. All right. Uh, just for fun, I tried to. Um, I took my perfect box code. So the the perfect box code. It's not possible to tell if it has an infinite loop or not, just because we don't know if the perfect box exists or not. Um, I typed that code into ChatGPT and said, is there going to be an infinite loop if I run this code? And um, it said, it was actually, it gave a pretty well-informed answer. It said, um, I can't tell you if there's going to be an infinite loop or not, 
because that depends on whether this perfect box function actually exists or not, um, which I thought was a pretty good answer. And then I said, um, can't you just tell in general whether some code will give an infinite loop or not? And then it said, that actually is called the halting problem and it is unsolvable by any computer and so I can't, uh, which I was also, that's a good answer, chat GPT. Sometimes they get it right. Um, the halting problem is not solvable by any, any computer. And I'm not talking about you know Mac versus Windows. This is a fundamental limitation of any um, even theoretical computing machine. All right, it makes me wonder. You know, can God solve the halting problem? Um, oh, maybe I'll let you think about that. Uh, something to think about. We like to say God can solve everything, but um, all right. Any, any thoughts about that? Anyone have any uh, hopes and dreams for the semester based on the in unsolvability of the halting problem? I think it's a very interesting thing to think about. I don't know if, if you feel that it's interesting, and um, you are free to feel whatever you like to feel about it. All right. In our remaining, we got 15 minutes left. I think we can start just very uh, talking about the very basics of the you know technical matter. So. We've been talking about ideas for a while, but the, as I said before, you know, Turing's major contribution to this whole thing, all of these were ideas that people could have thought about before. Turing's major contribution was to find a way of specifically referring to all of these things in the mathematical language of set theory, which allows you to actually reason in detail about it. And so, um, you know, what we're gonna talk about certainly for the rest of today and maybe next time, is not going to resemble at all what I was just doing, but we need to sort of set the mathematical framework in which we're going to discuss all of these things. So let's begin. Everything I'm gonna say for the next 15 minutes will be fairly obvious. It's just a matter of coming up with some terminology that we can base our, the rest of our discussion on. So I wanna talk about languages. You know, our textbook is called Formal Language. Uh, Turing described everything in terms of machines, but you could also describe things in terms of languages. And other people, other sort of math philosophers at the time, had similar ideas which they thought of in terms of what they called formal languages, which we might think of as like programming languages. Um, everything that I just said about Python actually you don't need to have a real computer that runs Python in order for what I said to be true. It's just a language. So we're going to talk about languages. So some basic terminology. Every language is built from what we're going to call an alphabet. So an alphabet is a finite set of symbols, which you could call letters if you like to. It's always going to be a finite set. like. A, B, C, etc., down to Z maybe. Or oftentimes computing machines are described in terms of the alphabet just zero and one. This would be a binary alphabet. Or something like there are standard alphabets that are used in computers. Uh, sort of an old fashioned one is called the ASCII character set, which includes all upper and lowercase letters plus number digits and other, you know, all the things that you see on your keyboard, basically. Um, or there's a, a more modern sort of lang uh, alphabet set that's used in computers called Unicode, which has uh, characters from other languages and things like that. These are all examples of computing alphabets. And the languages are built off of those individual characters sort of strung together in various more complicated ways. All right, usually in our, um, when we're do, you know, writing formulas involving these things, we use uh, the capital sigma there for the alphabet. That's a capital sigma, which is going to represent the set of characters. You know, in a real life computer, that's, that's uh, just zero and one if you look at it at a very fundamental level. But for most of our abstract examples, we'll use ABCs. All right, uh, okay, here's another easy terminology. A string, this is what you think it means. This is any finite 
a sequence of symbols from the alphabet. By the way, I hope you can read what I'm writing. Please let me know if, if you ever have a hard time seeing it. Any finite sequence of symbols from the alphabet. That is what you think the word string means like in a programming language. So for instance, for instance, for sigma equals say zero and one, um, you know, strings look like I said sequence, usually mathematically in a sequence you use commas, but I'm not gonna put commas in, in between, you know. Like that's a string of zeros and ones. All right. We would say this is is a string. The language, the way we would describe this is this is a string on sigma, meaning it's a string where the individual characters are taken from the alphabet, which is called sigma, or you know, zero, 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 or one by itself, that's a string. Um, there is one very important string which everybody loves. Uh, that is the empty string. The way that we're going to write the empty string in this class, you know, in a typical programming language, it would be like double quotes with nothing inside. But um, in this class, we are always going to write the empty string as a lowercase epsilon like that. So this here is the empty string. That is a string of zero characters. The empty string sounds stupid, but it's important. You know, it's similar to like the number zero, which sounds like it, it doesn't mean anything, but it, you need it to talk about anything uh, sophisticated. All right, that's called the empty string. This can be slightly confusing. So like this symbol, the epsilon, is not part of the alphabet because epsilon is not a thing by itself. It just represents a string with no characters in it. All right, so the epsilon does not count as one of the alphabet letters. It's just the empty string, all right? Any thoughts about this? I hope this is all sounds fairly straightforward. Um, one thing you can do with strings is any string has a length. And in this class, we are going to write the length of a string using the absolute value bars or the, the magnitude or something, all right? So that's that's what these absolute value bars mean. If you put a string on the inside, that means the length of that string. So that string has length three, or the length of, say, one by itself is one, or the length of the empty string is, what do you say? Zero, yeah. Is that a trick question? I don't know. Looks like there's one thing in there, but that one thing is the empty string, so it has length zero. All right, great. Um, generally speaking, we're going to use, I've been using zeros and ones, but actually for most of the, our examples that we talk about in this class, usually we use uh, ABC for individual characters in the alphabet, and we'll use XYZ for strings. This is just sort of culturally how we're going to typically use our variables. Although, occasionally, x will be a letter in the alphabet. All right. Uh, there's one operation which you can do using strings, and that is with a fancy terminology called concatenation. String concatenation. That is when you have two strings and you just stick them together one after another. That's called concatenation. In Python, uh, to do string concatenation, you just use a plus. You, you can add two strings together with a plus. Um, in this class, string concatenation is just going to be written kind of like multiplication with no symbol. So if I have x equals you know, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and y equals 1, 1, 1, then x, y, this means the concatenation x followed by y. So that is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. That's, that's what we call the string concatenation. And this is not a commutative operation. If you do it the other way around, x, x y is not the same as y, x, right? y, x means you do y first and then x. So that would look like 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. So this is the concatenation operation. 
which in Python would use a plus sign. I don't really like that in Python because I, as a mathematician, I like the plus sign to be commutative. But in Python strings, it's not. I mean, x plus y is different from y plus x. I guess nobody cares except for me. All right. Sometimes this, so this is the fundamental operation that you can do with strings. Sometimes we are going to use exponents, uh, which is not really a new operation, but like x squared just means x times x, which is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, right? So when I have an exponent, it just means repeated concatenations, and there is no like x to the minus 1. That, we just don't talk about that. All right, there are no, no non, uh, no exponents are allowed to be non natural numbers. You can't have a fraction in the exponent or anything like that. All right. Excellent. Five more minutes. Some more simple things. Um, here is a big definition. A language. A language is, this is going to look like a, a sort of meaningless definition, but a language is just any set of strings. from a particular alphabet. That's called a language. It's just any particular set of strings from an alphabet. So for example, for sigma equals 0, 1, if you're talking about just binary strings, uh, you know, something like this is a language. If I wanted to describe in words, this is the language of all strings of length one or two, right? That's what uh, I mean when I say language. Why this should be called a language and not just a set, we'll get to uh, next time, I suppose. But this is called a language in this theory. Or you can also define a language using more sort of fancy kind of set theory descriptions, something like this. This is a language. So this means the set of all strings which have this format, 1, 0, 1 to the power n, where n is a natural number. And I should say, in this class, this, this natural number thing here, this is the set of natural numbers which does include 0 in this class. Mathematicians and computer scientists are generally undecisive about whether the natural numbers include zero. Usually computer scientists say it does include zero. Often mathematicians say it doesn't. In this class, and this is really, I don't have a personal opinion, but in our textbook, zero always is included in the set of natural numbers. All right. Uh, by the way, I didn't say, what, is, what does it mean to have zero in the exponent? Anybody want to think, what, what, is, what, what does that even mean? One, zero, one to the power zero. Maybe, would you mind if I scroll up and add that into the, the notes here? What should be x to the 0 power in this case? Yeah. 1. This is a good, uh, this is a, a good guess. I know why you say that. It's not quite, using 1 it doesn't really make a lot of sense in this case. Just because like 1 is like one of these letters here, right? 1, um, it's not 1. Yeah. yeah, I would say the empty string is something that makes sense to to use for this the empty string i think if you were thinking one i imagine what you were really thinking is it should be the multiplicative identity element and the empty string functions as an identity element when you multiply it because anything times the empty string as concatenation just equals the same thing again so yeah thank you uh, so that's what this means. So this language, if I were to write out the elements, it would look like, sorry, the empty string first, and then 101, one, and then 101, 101, one, and then 101, 101, 101, et cetera, right? That's what those elements look like if you want to actually write them out in sequence. OK, or one more example. How about the empty set? That is a language. 
It's the empty language, which is basically useless by itself, but just like the number zero and other things, it's, it's important to talk about from time to time. The empty set counts as a language. Remember, the definition of language is just any set. Can I tell you? We got one more minute. Can I just tell you one more thing? Um, sort of the opposite of the empty language would be like the everything language. And that has a symbol. It's this. This is the set of all strings. Set of all strings on sigma. All right? That also is a language. So you can have a language of nothing, or you can have a language of everything. They are both kind of equally useless. The interesting languages are ones where only some things are in there and not everything. All right? All right, I think that'll do it for today. We'll do some, some actual business next time.